name which I uh, recently heard when uh, Professor Harshi was uh, presenting his uh, lecture. That is what, that was the first time I uh, got to know that the name has been changed. So thank you so much for the uh, uh, for for hosting me. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mangesh Kulkarni and uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Sandeshri Dulpuri, uh, uh, for being so uh, nice, forthcoming, and asking me if I can present the book. Um, in the beginning, uh, talking about a book becomes a sort of marketing, sort of you know a propaganda. So I do not want to. I did not want to talk only on the book, but uh, but a large. Uh, topic uh, about what China is. We often hear a lot about China, and I think most of us in the room, uh, all we know that uh, we have heard, we have we have talked, we have read a lot about uh, China in, in different fashions. Uh, whether that is uh, uh, Trump's uh, trade war or what is happening in Afghanistan, or uh, uh, on the larger context, uh, what happens in trade and in geopolitics, we keep hearing about. China quite frequently. So uh, when we talk about China, when we uh, discuss about China, there are a lot of literature which is available. I mean, uh, let me come to the point, uh, what instigated to choose a topic for China Inc. and uh, what, that top, what that book is all about. Um, again, this is not marketing, but the idea behind uh, it, what, what 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 was an important area which instigated or what what forced me to? There is a lot of literature on China in India which has been written by non-Indian academicians or researchers, okay, or maybe uh, the, the technocrats, maybe the retired ambassadors, and so on and so forth. There is a very uh, uh, small amount of literature written by our Indian colleagues on China and how we perceive China. And I think that was one of the bottleneck which kept uh, all of the researchers who decided to study China and they did not have an access. They had good teachers, the best academicians, but the literature was, was one of the points, you know, which, which created a kind of a bottleneck. So those all who wanted to study China by not even uh, subscribing to the courses. So that was the starting point, uh, which made all those who are looking into China looking or studying about China to understand that can there be enhancement or maybe maybe enrichment of that pool of literature on China in, in India. Because now when we look at what happened last year in Galvan or what is happening uh, on, on the boundary along LSE or uh, in India-China economic relations, we talk about deleveraging, we talk about decoupling, but often the literature uh, which we study, which we refer is again non-Indian. So that was a starting point. Then how literature, how this literature would be different? A second point of deviation from the present literature, which we see, and which I can claim is that the present literature on China, especially on economics, because I think that's that's the first thing, everything you know comes to our mind when we talk about China. Uh, apart from all of us who have been you know uh, students of political science, who, where we have studied about uh, socialism, communism, we have studied Mao, you know, Deng Xiaoping, and uh, the leadership, how how China has responded to various dynamics. But if you leave apart this small group, the lot of analysis which is thrown out in the air really does not have any cumulative or any uh, decisive studies about what aspects of Chinese economies are critical. Uh, starting with Gordon Chang or maybe uh, uh, Nicholas Ladi or maybe our uh, former chief economic uh, advisor, CEA, I mean, Subramaniam, they all take, uh, increasingly and, ex and exceptionally uh, quantitative look at uh, the Chinese rights. So China's economy or Chinese geopolitics has to do a lot with the Chinese economy, right? But the problem here is that there are various other uh, undercurrents which have been left unstudied by those so-called China experts. And uh, there was a need to look at those undercurrents in, in, in different fashions. For example, why choose state capitalism and economic statecraft? 
uh, there's, there has been so much written about China's economy, the growth, the rise, especially 2021 when China completes the first centenary goal of you know, uh, removing poverty and removing substantial population of China out of poverty. That is one centenary goal. So it was an important aspect to study what are the two terms are the ideas, themes, are the captions which can narrate best the Chinese rise or China's, China's economy. And that's how the research started a few years back, you know, focusing more on, all, on, on state capitalism, uh, focusing more on uh, the economic statecraft. Because there are certain reflections which we, which we see in, in present time, the way China behaves internationally, the way China Chinese investors uh, keep on pursuing uh, international companies acquisitions, and how China tries to wield its power through its its renowned uh, Belt and Road schemes, and what it reflects on the one hand. On the second hand, then where where does the Chinese state capitalism stand, and why it is so different? It is is it really different? different than the experience what we see in Brazil and India, the experience which we see in Thailand, Malaysia, or in, Ru in Russia itself. So this was, the, this was the broad idea behind putting the theme or wireframe of a book which will talk about Chinese growth, how party, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese state try to uh, convey or try to put into force as far as the state economy is concerned, then how that has been reflected in the larger context of economic statecraft. And while doing it, uh, it was important for anyone or any author or researcher to focus on the contradictions. So the book talks about number of contradictions, the way the state capitalism is proceeding ahead and the way the economic statecraft has been fashioned, refashioned, remodeled. And while doing it, it was essential from the research point of view that you have to be very specific about your variables. Well, now, once I was sure that I would be hypothetically talking about maybe how China delayed its collapse because China collapse is, you know, it's like a Bitcoin, you know, it, it is becoming, you know, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, a fashionable world among the researchers to talk about. And it was since 1990s. Uh, I think more than about 200 books have written about, you know, Chinese collapse, it never happened so. But then I wanted to say that this delayed collapse, you know, maybe, you know, how China is trying to dodge this ball for, for some more time, you know, how that, that is, that is being you know, taken by the Chinese party and Chinese state. And then how China is trying to secure its trade or its economy by proposing new models of it. Now, while doing that, while having that hypothesis in mind, the book wanted to have a, a strong variable which it would test with. And here, the PSUs, the public sector undertakings, which we, in technical terms, call state-owned enterprises in China, were taken as one of the important components to, 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 to study and analyze, analyze the economic growth, as well as the, um, the statecraft that China is building around. Now, why I call binary and why I call contest? I think it has become quite uh, common among the researchers to study about China and to be very conclusive. China, communism, China, socialist uh, capitalist, socialist capitalism, market economy, China uh, boundary, China LSE, uh, China Pakistan, China collapse, China rise. If you see, we study, we have studied China in a very fixated mind in a binary way. You know, in, in, in theoretically, we call it in a binary position. 
we use the China or Chinese analysis as you know a light switch on or off. Okay, or uh, maybe somebody you know playing matches, you know uh, winning or losing it, or maybe uh, uh, water or light or cold. So this binary conception and analysis of China, of Chinese rise, of Chinese state, has been in place, has been used by a lot of researchers to do and intensive studies on China. But because the Chinese or China studies has been, uh, has been uh, affected by such binaries, the, the true studies and researchers on Chinese growth has never come forward. Because these binaries cut short the, the further, more, uh, uh, more, more uh, in-depth analysis of China, okay? So that is it. We, we are fond of these oxymorons. We are fond of these binaries. And uh, we find these binaries are you know, very important because unless we have these binaries, we do not understand China. And I think that has become quite fashionable in academics also to, to study about China. When we put China on the blackboard in front of our students, we often say that this is China. Okay, look, this is, China. This is, this is India. Oh, this is China. Look at this is Russia. Oh, this is China, Chinese economic growth, you know, look you know, how, how the other economies are doing of, of similar nature. So binary opposition has become, you know, quite, uh, quite, quite strong as far as uh, the Chinese studies are concerned, because I think this is one key concept of structuralism, which has been, uh, which has been in place in sociology, in anthropology, or in, in, in other studies, in linguistics as well. But I took this binary as one area or one standard to figure out that one has to understand the China or the Chinese growth beyond such binaries. Because unless you do not understand China beyond these binaries or even contesting these binaries, beyond these binaries would be a little bit uh, too much for everyone because it, it, it asks you uh, a lengthier period of uh, time you need to involve into China studies. But over and above, even if you take binaries, uh, binary approach to study certain things, there are plenty of such binaries existing or binary position existing when any study takes place. And as a result of it, you know, you may say that, you know, uh, whether or not the Chinese government is performing better, if China would rise or it would fail, or maybe Chinese expansion, Chinese built on road, even the power transitions the, within, within the party power transitions. So all of this has been studied, has been analyzed from this binary, which is a bit, bit narrow. And as a researcher, not an author, as a researcher, one has to be a bit careful about when we have these binaries fixated in our mindset and study not only China, but study any new area or any new theme. So that is something you know which is essential for any areas expert or any researcher who is going to look at a subject. So the chief reasons behind picking these two areas, state capitalism and economic statecraft was this to take the, the analysis beyond the binaries and study how, where the state capitalism is going and you know, how the Chinese are readjusting uh, its policies uh, to maybe readjusting you know, its economic statecraft because state capitalism kept on changing on and off. Now coming to the state capitalism as such, state capitalism, most of us are not new. Uh, it's, it's, it's something you know, which we have been seeing for past few decades, especially for past two decades. And one can essentially see that you know, there are many developing countries which have turned away from the free market capitalism. And it is becoming more sort of modern state capitalism, which is, in, which is an advent. And what is it? Uh, the state, modern state capitalism is nothing but a combination of broadly. One is a traditional uh, state economic planning and secondly about some elements of free market competition. So maybe uh, the first question which came uh, in the mind is, you know, how one should look at the state capitalism. You know, the state capitalism is not something new, it's, it's old. And especially if you talk about China, that has not been recently introduced. 
state capitalism i mean uh, you have we have uh, 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 studies you know we have the quotes uh, from mao who in 1959 june uh, july uh, he he talks about you know how the chinese how the china is going to embrace the new kind of capitalism and that is the first time you know you know the china was introduced to state capitalism or capitalist economy so it is not a new concept for china also and what we were we seeing in the international economy or in the sphere of uh, global affairs the state capitalism is not new and rather you know you would see different shades of state capitalism which has come forward in past past two decades for example the young democracies have been have been uh, succumbing to pressure you know how much uh, uh, under in the name of state capitalism a power should be concentrated in the hands of few leaders okay and its effect on the uh, democratic culture and institutions then you have examples where uh, so called less democratic uh, countries like you have uh, thailand turkey malaysia you know where you will see that the rise of state capitalism has led to erosion of political system okay or maybe some level of you know uh, undermining of political freedom uh, and how that has really impacted its you know uh, strategic relations externally um, okay well i mean uh, not only democratic but let's take example so called democratic country like russia you know where you will see that the economic weakness being you know calling itself you know a country which which ex exercised which entertained uh, all side of uh, state capitalism has been facing serious crisis now if you put the state capitalism in china uh in the context of what i have said so far about the other democracies globally or maybe the less democratic authoritarian country like russia the case in china is is certainly different because as you see from 2007 onwards uh there is economic downturn um there are questions about china's economic capacities and you know or maybe how the party is trying to the communist party of china is trying to control the state at the same time uh not letting the chinese state slip into a hibernation uh where it would never recover from economic losses and then the state capitalism exactly reorienting its role reorienting its uh cent central position to connect these missing points so there is no free market capitalism but there is a state capitalism and and it is functioning you know quite uh quite phenomenally uh in in, in china now coming to the second point of economic statecraft uh, economic statecraft as as every one of us uh, very well aware you know it's it's about you know how how there is a correlation between the domestic and international policies uh, economics policy especially and you know how there are different dimensions of economic statecraft like you know when you when you uh, talk about your economy essentially you're relating your economy to the to the foreign economic policies your international policies and whatever the feedback whatever the reactions and whatever the uh, outcomes uh, the policy witnesses in the international forum it reflects back in the domestic policy making in india we have this 1991 so i think uh, uh, most of us are very very aware i will not get into the details of uh, uh, all these things now looking at these two aspects of chinese economy the state capitalism and looking at the reflections of economic statecraft it becomes quite interesting to know that well then in that case if that is the case what is the problem well the problem the book picks up at number of levels i think the first level of problem here is china was is a single party state chinese state was in control of its economic and social resources and china made the best use of using those resources to meet political uh aims and also you know uh, pursuing its international policy ambitions so i mean this is a fantastic script for any success story 
what is wrong there? You may question this. So the important part of the book talks about these contradictions which are emerging, which are creating fault lines, the way the state capitalism is functioning. State capitalism is much more stronger. State capitalism is looking for more control uh, over social, cultural, uh, uh, living life of the common Chinese. Now, it is a problem in the sense that at a, at, 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 at superficial level, we may not see the granular contradictions which the party is noticing or the Chinese state is uh, witnessing. And the book talks about a lot of those contradictions, the famous contradictions the book talks about, how the state of enterprises is given the prominence, but the state of enterprises or the state controlled economy is undermining the significance of private sector. There was a time when which is now or one chair power, who were in power for 10 years, 2003 onwards to 2013, made sure that there will be there will be equal treatment to state enterprises and private enterprises. But in recent times, since the book talks only about the contemporary times, the recent times in the last, last about five to six years, there is a growing imbalance between the private and public sector. That means there are more challenges for the economy to strive or to perform. The economy may perform because the state's growing intervention, but the state, but the economy as an independent entity to survive and perform in its own natural ecosystem has become difficult in China because there is a growing contraction of non-party spaces and the expansion of parties influence beyond anyone's imagination. Because the party is trying to tighten its grip over everything and anything through tiny party units. And this is becoming a major problem. Now, when China says that well of society, when China talks about harmonious uh, China, when China talks about standing up of China, or maybe you know, uh, shared dreams, shared prosperity, one has to understand the political, implied political meaning behind such sloganery. And that is where I think one has to seriously take into consideration these contradictions. Apart from privatization, the another uh, important area the book talks about is the public-private partnerships. The book deals with it in detail because the so-called public-private partnership is again induced by the state. It is not a natural phenomenon which is happening. China keeps on always talking about, look at the growth, look at uh, uh, the examples the Chinese economic is setting forth for other economies and please, we are the model, you can follow us. There are these deep problems uh, uh, in the way the state tries to sideline these partnerships, and these are growing. Um, the, 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 the influence of state is growing through such, uh, such measures. Another important part, when I said it was important to take one variable over here to distinguish how China either uh, trying to intensify state capitalism and trying to reorient, or reorient its uh, economic statecraft, and it became essential to take SOEs. But then when the research started happening, you know, when we started looking at SOEs, PSUs, we do not see this thing in India, but we see this thing in India. The SOEs have, um, SOEs have horizontal control over the Chinese economy. That is means sectoral control. And it has the vertical control over the Chinese economy. And that is an important part which makes It a USP of the book. Importantly, the state enterprises which are divided, there are centrally registered about 95 SOEs, but they have 150,000 subsidiaries spread across provinces. Now the problem, problem here is, which often 
those who study china superficially on from second source second resources are maybe taking only about this binary approaches do not see beyond these binaries and understand the the granular competition which exists within soes the soes as i mentioned in in one part of the book is nothing but is an open ring of walls and state want these soes to fight with each other they want these soes to compete with each other if you are competing and you are out surviving that means that you have ability and you will be promoted if you succumb to pressures and competition that means you are not natural leader or natural capacity to out sustain pressures so that's a simple standard that's a simple uh, 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 theorem the chinese state uses and which is very straightforward but the book talks uh, at length the contest which is taking place between the centrally registered public sector undertakings psus soes as well as the contest between their provincial subsidiaries so those subsidiaries for example we have a state grid state grid you know which 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 controls which supplies electricity for example uh, for for approximately 90% of chinese population or about 95% of the chinese physical uh, uh, physical land so you will see that the state grid has the provincial uh, subsidiaries but these subsidiaries again fight and that is that makes the whole state capitalism a shaky business because in the competition it is often seen that the political ambition of a party becomes secondary but the survival of the state enterprises becomes quite dominant the leaders struggle to control these enterprises at provincial level one more point i think the book uh, try to figure it out and i think it's 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 it, it, it was uh, a big finding then what happens to the other enterprises because the provinces like you know in 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 china there are many provinces provinces like chochian fuchian uh what happens to those you know for example in india you have uh, maratnas rao navratnas companies okay those are so is psus but these psus have their subsidiaries okay i mean just trying to metaphorically tell you but what happens to those enterprises which are owned by 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 the maharashtra state or or a state of telangana so there is a growing competition and this competition is undermining the 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 integrity of the party and integrity of the chinese economy so in the sense the contradictions in the chinese economy has started becoming visible but this is not just because it is a political in the sense but also because the chinese have understood lately that there are certain corrections need to be uh, need to be done in the chinese economy so maybe i'll, I'll take only one minute next because we need to have question and answers as well now if you put the book in the larger context the china inc state capitalism and uh, economic state craft what it indicates is in the end china should be spending more time extra time and more intensive efforts to open its market or to revisit this, the rules or to revisit the standards you know it has been observing for past 40 years or 70 years than inducing others to follow it because china is uh is is no more a free economy the book also talks about it it is a closing economy china is closing faster than any other economy maybe you may be thinking that it's only the uh, trump which we talked about uh, america for americans Uh, but china is closing its economy much faster than any other economy now given those uh, uh, i mean taking uh, those matters into consideration one can cl- conclude and the book concludes so that there is a uh, uh, more intensive efforts by the party to make the state to control the economy more uh, more rigorously or more you know uh, 
more strongly and at the result of it the result of it you would one would say a lot of changes happening in its economic statecraft the way state looks at economic statecraft and in the end the book also talks about the last line maybe there has been a lot of cycles between the state capitalism and economic statecraft happening from 49 and each cycle of interaction between the state capitalism and economic statecraft lasted for about 10 to 15 years that is uh with the two national people's congress every 10 years the leadership changes the form the 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 vigor and then the force of state capitalism changes which reflect which in return reflects into the economic statecraft of china and that's where i stop and i think i would like to take the questions which is the most important thing because i'm not here to talk only about the book but also here and answer the questions of yours thank you thank you sir uh, for your valuable insights i'm really looking forward to read your book so uh, before we uh, before we set the floor open for questions let me ask you one question so uh, there are two changes recent changes first is the for, uh, biden of biden administration took over and the second is how the post pandemic china looks like i mean it is the only major economy to have grown in past year means uh, all the other countries are struggling with first second and all the third waves and recently in march in alaska summit the chinese uh, ambassador uh, statement that uh, us does not have qualification to open uh, to have a dialogue open and for i mean uh, wait i had that statement that not have qualification to speak to china from position of strength so how do you I means how what is your view on this so actually i'll answer your uh, second question first i mean china does not have any position to say something is somebody some state is qualified or not and china definitely cannot say that uh, uh, us is not qualified or us cannot have this hierarchy to deal with china but china has been doing this hierarchical treatments or taking this hierarchical approach to its neighboring countries as well you know we do not see uh, we do not see uh, china talking to india uh, at in the same fashion okay at the same level so i think uh, that statement you should not take that seriously um, you you certainly know that you know china has been having this dual standards to have any negotiations or have any discussions dialogue with its neighbors that's that's the an answer to your second question the first question about post pandemic you know how china looks china looks stronger the party looks stronger because you know what has happened in past one years the public spending has grown okay the public spending has grown more than 40% and how this public spending is spending is happening this public spending is happening through the state sectors is happening through the state enterprises so that means that there is more control over the economy by the state by the party and the state so that is how the post pandemic china looks the post pandemic china looks stronger the post pandemic china looks you know as you know um, they have got an opportunity to 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 streamline earlier i think post pre pandemic i'll just explain you pre pandemic the chinese leaders were uh, were holocausted by you know uh, what will happen to our supply chains you know what will happen to our you know uh, uh, production lines uh, which are spread across the globe i think the pandemic has given them a natural exclude excuse to now streamline those supplies streamline those um, um uh, production lines and also pandemic has given them and i think this is in case with all the countries the pandemic has given china an, an exceptional opportunity to focus on innovation refocus what china lacks in the time of critical times and in past one and a half years there has been so much of criticism the way china handled you'll be surprised by this statement but the, the way china handled the way china was taken aback being being uh, 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 being uh, a global production uh, engine of the global market uh, nobody thought that china would be you know taking uh, china would have been taken by surprise it was taken by surprise when it came to critical infrastructure it came to critical um, you know public uh, health so i think pandemic has been uh, uh, a major you know proved to be a major learning curve for china thank you thank you sir 
so uh, yeah. tala ansari has raised his hand he is also almanas of our department and doing phd in iit bombay so tala you can yeah. unmute yourself and ask the question sir am i audible yes tala go on yeah so i have two three questions uh, regarding bri the first question is uh, the post pandemic effects for bri uh, second is um, often bri is quoted as uh, uh, by some scholars as a globalization with chinese characteristics so what according to you are those characteristics and third is um often it is emphasized as uh, bri bri is reported as inclusive globalization so the word inclusion has different shades so what in the chinese society's context uh, what does this word inclusion mean okay the, your voice was uh, breaking tala but i think uh, all three Three questions have to deal with BR, I think, right? So I'll try to answer uh, that. Uh, yeah, BR related. Yes. So let me let me uh, answer your questions briefly, because I think uh, we have a paucity of time, so I need to be considerate about it also. So BRI is the Chinese scheme to securitize its economic interest in in simple, plain languages. why securitizing its economic interest because in past 40 years of its opening up china had squeezed generational growth in one generation so where there are two and three generations put together help the economy to rise up the chinese put only one generation and you know intensively developed the economy and then the pace of the economic growth has been enough even if it has slowed down the pace the intensity of that growth has helped china to glide that glide the gliding is important thing to make sure that that gliding happens and the economic growth persists even if it about 5% or 6% you know with the size of that you know 12 trillion of economy it is important for china to maintain its trade partnerships maintain those production lines supply chains intact for next 20 years and that is why that is where you know uh, uh the chinese state and party leaders got hooked up with the beautification beautiful idea dream idea about bri bri is not a product of 2013 you know xi jinping came it's, it's not it started prior to that now if you see the chronology you will understand that uh, the bri is something the state proposed to make uh, sure that the economy is immune from all the shocks B- before bri there were other concepts which were existing in the in the chinese state like internationalization going abroad policies okay tnsi policy that's a that's a talent policies these policies did exist or were uh proposed by the chinese leaders and the party to make sure that the economic performance and the economic growth sustains now the question about inclusiveness and i think before that one question about how uh, i i i forgot the second question of you but i'll just answer in brief where the chinese would definitely say that this is an inclusive policy it doesn't look like because i'm um, if you start with the first bri forum which took place on in may 2019 it did not give a look that it is an inclusive because uh, there is no standard format there is no preamble there is no multilateral uh, framework attached or through which uh, the bri has been conceived it's just a bilateral agreement maybe under bri uh, the economic uh, proposal which has been put forth to Czechoslovakia would be different than its 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 neighboring country hungary okay. uh, bri in malaysia is different than malaysia bri in indonesia okay so it is a completely subjective isolated well curated uh, policies economic uh, imperialistic policies which china takes um into consideration so there is no inclusiveness okay what was the what was the second question tala yeah am i audible now yeah you are it's breaking okay. in between but you yeah. can go ahead uh, what is the post pandemic effect for bri and also my question 
Um, uh, I mean, what whatever China does will have certain characteristics which are emanating from their own society, right? So, uh, know. well, I think it is still breaking. Let me collect collect few more points. I think then I may uh, able to answer. I think it was still breaking. See, I, the problem is there is no reciprocity. Uh, the beings are let me put it in a different way the chinese partnerships chinese engagements with those countries along the belt and road scheme have been devised have been planned in such a way it looks like it, there is a hierarchy between between the industries between the economic agencies which are partnering uh, who would fund it the Chinese agency would fund it. Who would make the final proposal and blueprint of the negotiations and the agreement? The, 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 it is the Chinese. Who would the these local production units would sell? Okay, in, in local. So who are going to get benefit? Those are the productions who have been done by these companies. Where from where the ancillary companies are coming from China? I mean, so you should understand the broader plan uh, behind uh, the BRI, and I all. Uh, risking my talk about the success and failure of BRI, but so far in past five to six years, BRI hasn't achieved anything. There are mid stop gap, you know, pit stops where you know there is a lot of oiling is going on into BRI. There is a lot of um, revisiting is going on about BRI within the party. Uh, a lot of BRI projects have been stopped. A lot of BRI projects have been withdrawn. Uh, you know, there is a China insurance company which have been instituted by the party that is to give, uh, that is to provide insurances for those companies which are returning. And if you just go and track the figures of how much you know, insurance has been given to returning companies. That number is simply, you know, amplifying by double numbers and two numbers. So you would you would see the 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 chronology. What is exactly happening in China as far as the BRI is concerned? I I think Tala, I may not be able to. I haven't given you the answer properly because I didn't. I couldn't catch your uh, questions properly. Maybe, but um, yes, sir. Thank you. But I've got broad answer. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tala. So uh, we have a question from in chat box. It is a kind of general question that will China surpass the US as the world superpower? But I will uh, try to tweak it a little that what are the limitations on China if we compare it to the US? And what can are you, the areas which... Can you can you repeat it actually once again? So there is a question in chat box that will China surpass the US as the world's superpower? But I would like to tweak it a little <laughs> that what are the some limitations on China? In compare means if we compare it to the United States, and what are some areas which uh, we see that it it cannot means in the at least in the recent time that uh, in our time that it cannot surpass United States. You know, I think I I I I like these sort of questions, but I think you know, um, especially students of political science, and I, we have to look at the larger picture. Superpower is something, and I think uh, an amateur, you know, social scientist can ask this question: superpower, you know, what will happen to China and all these things. But I think important than the superpower, can China be a great nation first to be a superpower? Is China responsible, accountable to the global order to be a responsible state or to be a superpower? It, had China earned enough soft power capacities or attributes? To be a superpower, I think if you, every one of us has answer to this question, I do not need to go straight forward and say whether China would become a superpower or not. But you know, I will answer that from the party party point of view. Yes, China wants to be a superpower. China wants to be superpower fast. You know, everything in China is so much uh, faster. They do not have patience. Uh, you know, quicker. You know, I, I'll give you many examples. Uh, for example, you know, China China started um, its trade with India, uh, few millions in 2000. At present, it is about you know hitting about 100 100 billion dollars, very fast. Uh, and trade, uh, they want to sell, come and sell to China, sell to India. There's a quick profit. 
no i can do a trade with akshay in 2 minutes right we have this you know swap of products and the profits as the chinese would they make investment about 50 million 50 billion dollars and wait for 20 years they will not you ask me i'll give you the answer straight away on any bond paper they will not do it because chinese are very impatient they want to become they want to grow faster and somewhere china in uh, us is not recognizing it and that is agonizing for china that we are not being recognized we have risen but we are not recognized and i think that is a major problem for 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 china going ahead so that's that's an answer to the superpower that that sort of you know uh, uh, question what was the other question akshay you had just paraphrased uh, i mean what are the some areas uh, where china means lags behind than the us that was i oh, technology technology is one area you know it lags far behind uh, china might be producing the pens which are using to write notes while hearing to me those are chinese made pens but the ball points you know the ball points the ball points are not chinese made those are made by japanese uh, many things i can give many examples but i think this is not about trade this is not about uh, many things but i can say that there are many technologies which are called core technologies and the china really do not have command over those core technologies and that is the problem number one and second it is not the core technology which stops only but the sense of innovation as you will read it i i can say that innovation comes from free mind okay innovation invention comes from free mind if there are not free mind in china i mean hanging on trees okay chinese leaders they realize it but they do not say it so no matter how much heavy they fund the national institutes for research the research or the innovation uh, the research lacks the original innovation that's a problem you do not do you do not need to do any hard google search for this thing the innovation capacities of taiwan and innovation capacities of china are different because innovation in china it happens which is state induced state sponsored state controlled in taiwan the innovation happens which is more liberal uh, it happens at at a very uh, 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 at very uh, fragmented levels it happens at the level of individuals at the level of startups which is not the case in china thank you, thank you sir so next yeah. question is marathi uh, that taliban has seen a string of pearls a ghatak banu shakil ka means uh, he want he wants to ask that what are the stakes of china in means uh, recent turmoil in afghanistan and if no if you want to take one more question no i'll answer this question akshay okay uh, will taliban become a string of pearls of china i would not say no i think it's it's very much possible uh because uh, pakistan's involvement in afghanistan and uh, secondly the way um, chinese have been talking with a lot of uh, uh, islamic uh, uh, elements in central asia to make its uh, muslim populated area uh, shock absorbed and so there are greater stakes of china in afghanistan in taliban control of afghanistan so there is a possibility but one thing is very sure over here is that i think more than any other country in afghanistan china has more stakes involved china hasn't closed down its mission you have to keep this thing in mind russia hasn't closed its mission so certainly there are chances but again the problem over here is like the other states i think let's let's spend another 30 seconds on this the string of pearls what china talks about what the indian researchers also talk about i think we have to take it very uh, objectively about it that string of pearls uh, the existence of string of pearls or uh, maybe the significance intensity of string of pearls is not as much as as we, we we think so i think let let 
let it uh, uh, go sideways, I don't think that would uh, seriously be a problem because most of the members of the string of pearls have recently understood that they're making bad choices. Uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, they are lately in, uh, realizing what kind of mistakes they're making. Uh, so I think they have, I have answered your first question, but also there is extra answers you know, for subsequent questions if there are any. Yes, sir. We will take the one one last question that it okay. is from Rushikesh Inamdar, our MS student. Sir, how do you look? How do you how do you look India's uh, quit from RCEP and can ASEAN countries and India collaboratively collaboratively counter China's eco economic power? It is not one minute answer question. I'll take two minutes to answer this thing. Rishikesh, the, the, the first blueprint of RCEP, which, which, which we know today, was proposed, by, uh, was proposed by the Japanese. Japanese wanted India to be part of that scheme, ASEAN Plus uh, scheme. And there was another proposal which had come from China and uh, India wasn't part of that. So, India's entry into RCEP was uh, a bit of uh, a bit of surprise for China, and India could have or should have uh, leveraged on that. We we lost that opportunity. Our ex uh, our exit from the RCEP was it timely or was it wise? I would say it was not wise, and it was not needed. We would have bought time. I mean. Uh, we had been so much anthropologically happy to lengthen the talks with the RCEP members. I mean, the so-called RCEP members, we bought years, months, meetings. I mean, uh, you cannot simply you know, back off and say that we do not have any, any, any choices. Finding no choices is a failure of your negotiations, okay? And you cannot just back off, that's, that's one thing. Working with ASEAN against China is possible, it's certainly possible. Um, we have been uh, doing that, uh, the policies of uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Act East Asia, uh, engaging with the East Asia, engaging with ASEAN countries is, is all well, well considered. But if you think from the ASEAN perspective, would ASEAN compensate, would ASEAN allow Indian companies, Indian state, uh, some seating space, I doubt how serious the Asian state would be because that means they have to outspace China for a, by some degrees, by some percentage. And then, you know, because it, it's, it's a fixed, how geopolitical space is a fixed space. So, you know, you, you are making, you're outspacing by making space for yourself. That means that ASEAN would need to create some space, India would need to create some space while dealing with each other by outspacing Chinese. Now, the real question is all about it. How the Chinese happily would give away that place to us or maybe how happily Chinese ASEAN would compromise with that. Now, that's the real thing. So, in, in, in hypothetically, we are doing it. No, uh, hypothetically, it is possible. Practically, we're doing it. But I think one needs to wait you know the real results in coming few years now uh, how, how where it would lead to right thank you sir thank you sir so would you like there is one more question so would you like to take it or just yeah yeah sure sure go ahead so chin la shah dena sandarbhat cord group bhavishyat kitpat prabhavi thare uh well i think quad has been uh quite a disturbing disturbing uh fact for China. China did not uh, thought, you know, because of uh, past few years when Quad 1, Quad 2, the discussions were happening, were ongoing for about past couple of years, China really did not wish or did not want India to be part of Quad. It's my personal interpretation that the whole scheming of engaging with India through informal summits were somewhere to entertain India or stop India from joining Quad and ensuring India that you know you are independent, your, your, your foreign policy has been autonomous. But by joining Quad, I think it's a major spoke in the wheel for China because the Quad is not only about the strategic partnership, it goes beyond that. It talks about economic partnership, it talks about how these four economies and state 
we try to figure out different opportunities to work together around because then the quad would be supplementing to larger Indo-Pacific scheme of things. So, you know, if you put now all these uh, uh, variables together, that is certainly upsetting for China. And suddenly in past one year and a half, the China has, China feels that it is left alone. And within Asia, it feels it is encircled, okay? Because it does not like, you know, Japan and US, it really also does not trust Russia. Uh, so you will see, you know, why China feels a lot of jitters, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, cornered uh, when the Quad comes or the discussion Quad Summit happens, the Quad Summit takes place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to request Pandit ma'am to make two remarks. Yes. Are there any more questions? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the department, I would like to thank Dr. Arvind Yallari, who readily agreed to our request to give uh, a talk on China. China, as he has rightly said, we, there is a lot of uh, misunderstandings of the way we look at China. And maybe it is from the 1962 battered victim syndrome that we have. And China has grown a lot, changed a lot. And I might, should congratulate him that he has uh, uh, told us the internal contradictions which are there within the Chinese economy. And the Chinese Communist Party, which is a single party, but not a monolith by any stretch of imagination, has its own regional issues and others where it's trying to manage uh, two contradictions. That is capitalism with a communist political structure within it. And as he has rightly said, the whole uh, issues of what to say internal discord between the private, um, what we can call them, the MNCs, is it right, Arvind? And the state That's right. yes. state owned MNCs, and how do they differentially function? And then the whole issue and the issue also of Jack Ma. I wanted to just ask you, is Jack, where is Jack Ma these days? It because uh, is he there or is because uh, we don't see him very much. So that is something that makes. Another thing I wanted to ask you, Arvind. Yes. We, see, usually when we teach multinational corporations, we teach them as non-state actors. But when you come to the Chinese uh, example, the state is the multinational corporation and the multinational corporation is the state. So how would you think we should categorize it? Then do we take the Susan Strange? I'm very happy that you're doing very good work in political economy, an area in international relations that has been long neglected. So would you agree with the Susan Strange formula that where there is power, there is money, and where there's money, there is power? So the Chinese model is a more uh, robust model than this division between the state and the market. Thank you for the comments, ma'am. Yes, I agree with the, that statement. You know, wherever there is money, there is power. Wherever there is a power, there is money because I think that has been institutionalized in Chinese. The concept of wealth of nation is so much uh, 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 idealized and the party thinks that, I, I mentioned in the chapter that, you know, uh, uh, people, you know, having uh, small things hanging around the neck, were selling small things in Beijing in 1978-79. That was the earliest cases where the, where the state capitalism started growing. And the Chinese party members saw it's an opportunity by giving people control over their wealth, private wealth, was an important way of ensuring them that there is a better life. And by doing that, there was a way to ensure that party would have the longer sustained legacy among the society and people. So I completely agree with that statement. Secondly, has uh, party has turned into MNCs and this the enterprises have turned into the state. I also partly agree with that because I think it is the state which is deciding, making policies or laying down the framework, the way the economy should, 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 should act. Secondly, how and where the, these economic aid should diversify. It is the state which is deciding where the sovereign fund should go. 
who who are the uh, portfolio investors in 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 china how much bond how much uh, 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 investments they should do so it's all controlled by the state so i think the state has expanded increased its workload by converting into you know some kind of mnc jobs the third important uh, statement very jack ma jack ma is, uh, is 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 very well i think what i want to say uh, jack ma shouldn't have done few things i think what what i think in media doesn't really come out is i think the poor reading uh, beyond jack ma's uh, you know that speech in october 2020 and you know xi jinping is getting irritated about it i think it's it's it's, it's beyond that jack ma you know if, if i can speak little in a lighter mode over here jack ma was trying to be michael jackson you know he was simply jump off the plane have big uh, programs uh, have has his you know trying to become as a celebrity in china which is a sin he cannot become a celebrity in china where the party is the only uh, you know is the only one institutionalized celebrity e incubation center or uh, you know whatever you can we can call it so jack ma was trying to touch that which was forbidden secondly the credit business in the credit business is i think the last mistake he made it he shouldn't have done that jack ma i think over a period of time was under impression that some of his mistakes will be you know forgiven by the state but i think state is not in a mode to forgive but in a mode to uh rectify major mistakes which which happened which it did uh inadvertently in past 40 years and jack ma was a major problem and you know jack ma is something you know you know the but so young kang the case you know when so young kang was put behind the bars that was a lesson so jack ma is also a lesson Jack Ma is a lesson for all the Chinese private players, saying that you are not above the state. Uh, you know, the McGregor in his book, he says, you know, everyone who outgrows uh, beyond party and becomes uh, thinks himself is, you know, he is more important than the party. He'll be the first one who'll be, you know, put in under the gullet. And I think that that is exactly has happened in China. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much. Any more questions from the students? No, ma'am. There are no more. No more questions. Okay. I also have one other issue. Can I ask you, Arvind? Yes, yes. Sure, ma'am. How would you compare the Deng Xiaoping's advice, saying that you should not uh, mean do things quietly, don't uh, advertise, with the wolf warrior diplomacy that Z has brought in, especially in the post-COVID period? uh chinese diplomats have been extraordinarily aggressive which has never been the chinese style because we were studying uh, in jnu and we were told that their every comma and full stop has a meaning they talk very less but you read between the lines now there's a sea change in their diplomacy they are so aggressive so do you think this wolf for your uh, diplomacy is a change from the earlier part of the chinese diplomatic model yes ma'am there is a major departure the way the diplomats and diplomacy used to function in the chinese case especially during the tang shopping's time you know uh, uh, keeping low profile mm. uh, uh, speaking less uh was insisted because i think the chinese were you know trying to build the image uh, it was important for china to give a positive rising image to the global members and it it worked very well now those who are saying you know uh, you will see the ambassador or chinese ambassador in sweden a few months back he made a statement that friends would be treated with the dinner enemies would be treated with the shotgun he used the word shotgun they are extremely extremely uh uh short tempered uh there is increasing pressure by the party to make these statements otherwise you know the countries would take china chinese foreign policies as you know 
not mature or can be bullied. So China wants to give us, you know, give an impression that they cannot be bullied in any conditions. Okay, that's that's number one. Secondly, those who have been given uh, uh, positions in the in the missions or in the envoys internationally are those who have been uh, trained in past five to six years, especially from uh, 2008 and nine, where these diplomats have seen how rough weather is, you know, when they are dealt with the foreign uh, missions, the foreign, foreign countries. So this is just a reflection of it. The Chinese is paying back um, what they have earned, what they have learned from the global affairs. And third important thing over here is where it would lead to. China is going to become aggressive. Uh, China is going to become, you know, outspoken in coming years and coming decades, as long as uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, warrior diplomacy, and as long as uh, there is a belief among the Chinese that, you know, if they do not, they have, they, they need to shout to be heard. If they do not say anything, you know, they will not be heard. And this is going on uh, quite quite uh, long for about last four to five years. And I think all thanks to uh, President Xi Jinping, because you do not see this kind of phenomena happening uh, once upon Hu Jintao's time. There was, there were, actually the Chinese called that period, 10 year period as a lost decade. There is a, there, there is a, there is a literature in China, they call it the lost decade. And you would see that now the Chinese want to recover those lost years. And now there is a reason, you know, why Chinese are trying to be, you know, aggressive, uh, you know, stepping out and talk more aggressively at international forums. And they are no more benign. They are no more sweet. I don't want them to be sweet, but, you know, you, you see them, you know, how they talk. But the, day, but, but the way to deal with the Chinese is not to be, uh, not to be you know, uh, complex and not to be, you know, uh, submissive. You know, the best way to deal with the Chinese is to be out, outspoken, to be talk straight. That's how it is, actually. Okay, should, uh, on behalf of the department, uh, Arvind, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, basically, I agree with you. You are a different type of a scholar who has seen China from within, who knows the language. And it is very important for a country like India, whose neighbor, we are the neighbor of China, and China, the bigger part, to understand even the Chinese point, not judge our uh, China by our point. And it is very essential that more scholars like you emerge in India who take Chinese seriously from what they say, from their own literature, rather than, you know, we writing something from our perspective. So, because that would vary to a large extent. So, I congratulate you because this is very good and it is needed in uh, India's foreign policy as well as international relations literature. Hope more students will follow your path. Thank you, you so much are. for your time and uh, accepting our invitation. I thank all of you who have attended this online and I thank the head of the department as well as Akshay for all the help they gave me and the department. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. And Arvind, do always come to the department and help us make yeah, sure. Ch uh, Chinese studies and others much more realistic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Really Thank look you, forward to your book. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, department, once again. Thank you so much.